stresses in Niku are practical at all. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, dear friends. As Dr. Padam has emphasized the importance role of fresh start treatment for neonatal unconjugated hyperbil. And in fact, neonatal unconjugated hyperbil has been kept or has been reinforced multiple times and we all are more or less managing it appropriately. The problem arises when the serum bilirubin is predominantly direct. And that is an area which has been left or referred to pediatric gastroenterologists or a pediatric hepatologists. We, as a neonatologist in an ICU, become a bit uncomfortable when our bilirubin, direct bilirubin exceeds 2 mg percent. And the issue or problem is that when the, when the baby leaves an ICU, is one, one month or six weeks or eight weeks old, and if a baby with direct hyperbil crosses eight weeks, the prognosis ultimately turns out to be negative. So in this presentation, I'll talk about what is direct hyperbil, what are the incidences, pathophysiology, what are the clinical features, how do we evaluate, what are the management practices, and two particular scenarios, polystasis in very low birth babies and polystasis in babies who are receiving total parental nutrition in our NICUs. So what is neonatal polystasis? A conjugated hyperbil in a newborn as a consequence of diminished bile flow is defined as neonatal polystasis. And the levels to label hyperbilirubinemia as a direct hyperbil are very stringent. If your total bilirubin level is less than 5 and direct or conjugated bilirubin is more than 1, it is direct hyperbil. So even if the bilirubin conjugated bilirubin is 1 mg per cent, you will label it as a conjugated hyperbil and you will start evaluating and managing the baby accordingly. If your bilirubin, total bilirubin is more than 5, then if your conjugated level is more than 20 per person, it again becomes a conjugated hyperbil. So if you are having a baby with a bilirubin level of say 9 or 8 and his direct level is 1.8, it predominantly becomes conjugated hyperbil. Even if for treatment purposes, we take, we take total hyperbil as the as the treatment criteria until unless direct exceeds 50%. But for evaluation purposes, these are the definitions which needs to be kept in the mind. The common method, estimation method to detect direct hyperbil is diage method, which usually overestimates direct level fraction. But still, it is practically considered that even with diage method, these two criteria or these two numbers will be considered as significant. Now usually as a neonatologist, whenever a direct hyperbil word is mentioned, it keeps in our mind that the problem is somewhere in bile system or biliary canary ply or drainage system. But it always is not so. There are two components. One is, so there are two components. One is hepatocyte and another is the drainage system. The problem can anywhere be in the excretion of bile. So whether it's a biliary excretion from the hepatocyte or biliary drainage from the biliary system, it's going to be biliary polystasis or polystatic jaundice. So, in the hepatocyte, it could be inflammation or it could be non-inflammatory hepatitis or in the drainage system, it could be limited to small bile ducts or it could be a complete obstruction of large bile ducts. Now, if you look at causes of neonatal polystasis, majority of the causes are hepatocellular, which means excretion from the hepatocyte almost 53% and then obstruction at the biliary system is approximately 38% which are known as obstructive polystasis or which usually we consider as obstructive or neonatal polystasis. Among hepatocellular, these are the three predominant causes. One is neonatal hepatitis, predominantly 47%, metabolic causes and variable etiologies. And in the neonatal hepatitis, majorly they have idiopathic giant cell hepatitis Rest of them are having either torch infection, among them CME most common, or neonatal bacterial sepsis, or urinary tract infection, or malaria. Metabolic causes, galactosemia is a predominant reason, almost 35%, and then other like alpha-mantrixin deficiency, babies on TPM, tyrosinemia, hemochromatosis, or solace disorders. And other reasons like hypothyroidism, polycystic disease, or insuficient bile syndrome. 
Among obstructive causes, polydocal cyst is a minor component, 4% and the rest of them are biliary atresia. And then you have non-syndromic paucity of ducts like and syndromic variety like Allegri syndrome or non-syndromic like PFICs. Now clinical presentation, the foremost clinical presentation is any baby with a dark urine and a pale stool almost sacrosanct with neonatal polystasis. So whenever you are looking for a baby with jaundice, always ask for urine color and stool color from the mother. A pale stool for birth is for bilirubin atresia has a sensitivity of 89.7% and a specificity of 99.9%. Looking at the causes, mean age of presentation in biliary atresia is in the first and second week, 3 to 12 days, while in hepatocellular causes, it is in the second half of the first month because the reasons are limited to that. Biliary atresia babies are usually well baby, normal growth and normal development, and they have predominantly pale stools. Now, looking at the early diagnosis, importance of early diagnosis, people have devised stool color cards, and the cards have been proven and utilized in multiple countries. Now, later manifestation of polystasis depends upon the implications of polystasis like retention of these components, bilaxis will lead to pruritis, bilirubin will lead to zombies, polystol will lead to zentromata and other things. Oblique reduction of acid delivery to the intestine which leads to malabsorption of fat soluble vitamins, water soluble vitamins and later manifestation are limited to liver failure or which means ascites or decompensation. Now, how do we evaluate a baby with neonatal polystasis? The first and foremost thing you should ask is whether the baby is sick or ill or well. If the baby is sick, the diagnosis goes in another direction. If the baby is well, they are usually limited to biliary atresia. The first three things which we should get in any baby with neonatal polystasis is complete liver function test with GGT, thyroid function test and sepsis screen because majority of the reasons are limited to this. Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Pediatric Gastroenterology chapter has device come up with a beautiful algorithm to evaluate these babies. So this is very simple. A baby with neonatal polystasis, whether he is a sick or a non-sick child. If the baby is sick, do a sepsis screen. If the sepsis screen is positive, either it's a pure neonatal bacterial septicemia or it could be galactosemia. So you should rule out galactosemia in these babies because galactosemia predisposes to E. coli sepsis as well as to neonatal polystasis. If the baby is still sick but the bacterial septic screen is negative, it can be suffering from other infections and you should look out for CME or HSV. If the baby is well and he is having pale stool, it goes more in favor of biliary atresia. If the baby is not sick and still he is having pigmented stool, then there are metabolic reasons like which we have discussed and we will be having a further test. A baby who is well, having neonatal polystasis, Having a colic stool, pale stool, you should do a fasting ultrasound and fasting means 4 hour fasting ultrasound. If a fasting ultrasound is normal, in this scenario, you should go for liver biopsy, oblique, you should refer the baby where liver biopsy can be done and you start specific treatment based on liver biopsy. If the fasting ultrasound is showing polydocal cyst, there they can be for surgery and the fasting ultrasound is showing small blood bladder or absent blood bladder, video atresia need to be excluded. We should come in the next presentation. So these are the babies who had a colic stool, who are relatively well and whose ultrasound is showing contracted ball bladder or absent ball bladder. Now, if the baby's age is less than six weeks, you can still give them some time and explore further by way of way of doing HEDA scan. But that's an optional test, an over-utilized test. You need to have a priming of three days with either phenobarbicone and then do a HEDA scan. Now HEDA scan has its own fallacies you will see later on. If there is no exclusion in HEDA scan, it points towards biliary atresia and these are the candidates for liver biopsy with, and if the liver biopsy confirmed, they should go for intraoperative collagiogram. If the age is more than 6 weeks, you should not waste your time in HEDA scan and go straight for liver biopsy. If the baby is more than 90 days and decompensation oblique more than 120 days, you should not even wait for liver biopsy and sends them straight forward for a Kasai operation wherever the facilities are available. Now India has two good centers where Kasai operations are being done routinely and they have very good results like SGPGI or Delhi or PGI Chandigarh. Now the babies who are well and still having pale stool, pigmented stools, 
So these are babies who can have metabolic conditions like galactosemia, which can be utilized by urine analysis. When are you going for urine for reducing substance? Always get urine for reducing substance by two methods: one by dipstick and another by Benedict's. Benedict's detect all reducing substances in urine, and if you do by dip, dipstick it detects sugar. So if your sugar is negative and Benedict is positive, it indicates that the baby is having non-glucose reducing reducing substance, which indicates source galactose. You should also check for urine for organic acid, urine and serum amino acids. Do a urine for succinyl acetone for tyrosinemia and serum iron and ferritin for neonatal hemochromatosis. And this is the virus logging. There are other tests like alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiencies, sweat chloride, allergy syndrome, x ray and eye examination, and bone and nerve examination for other metabolic conditions. Now, one underutilized test is ultrasound abdomen. We do prescribe ultrasound abdomen, but we never tell the radiologist what to look for. The first thing is, you should have a 4 hour fasting ultrasound abdomen. Second is, ask the radiologist to see for them, see for triangular cold sign, see whether the gallbladder morphology is normal, the wall membrane is normal or contracted. There is no contraction of wall that post with carries a sensitivity of almost 60 to 70 percent. So if a baby is having 4 hour fasting, the gallbladder should be distended. And when you do a repeat ultrasound post feeding, post uh, breast feeding or spoon feeding, the gallbladder should contract. If the gallbladder is not distended and not contracting, it almost always indicates that the baby is having bilirubin atresia. And if you are unable to see CBD, obviously it points towards bilirubin atresia. HIDA scan, as I told you, is a glamorous test, but it's an over-exploited test. It has limited role if you have a documented pain stool, which means if you have a documented pain stool, it always indicates that there is problem in excretion and HIDA will not add anything. If you have a pigmented stool, it always indicates that the baby is excreting bilirubin or high pigments and HIDA will not add anything. The second thing is priming. Majority of the babies, when they reach to a center where they can be evaluated, they are 3 weeks, 4 weeks or 5 weeks old and you do not have time to prime them for a week and then get HIDA scan. It's an optional test and it only adds whenever there is an uncommon diagnosis like CBD perforation. So just take one example. This is an 8-week male baby. He had pale stool since birth. The GGT was 13-39 which was somewhat elevated and sonography was showing contracted gold bladder. Now an 8-week baby with a contracted gold bladder with a pale stool should straightforward have been subjected to liver biopsy. But unfortunately the HIDA scan was done. HIDA scan was showing the tracer in the liver and one hour post injection of tracer, the tracer was in the intestine. So this was in the intestine. Once you have seen the tracer in the intestine, the pediatrician, treating pediatrician was assured that this is not biliary atresia. So metabolic and infective workup was done, which took almost two weeks, it was negative. LFT continued to deteriorate, stools always remain equally, biopsy was reviewed and pathologist was very sure that it is biliary atresia. HIDA scan was again reviewed at 10 weeks. And even in this, if you see that there is a tracer in the intestine at 1 hour, but tracer disappears from the intestine at 2 hour. Now what does it mean? It means that HIDA scan just show you the tracer's presence in the intestine. It can be excreted by the circulatory system also. So when, the, when you inject the dye in your blood, in the baby's blood, the vessels can themselves excrete the HIDA or immunodiacetic acid dye in the intestine and you can have false positive HIDA scan. Even in significant hepatitis, you can have a false negative HIDA scan. So it has its own paralysis. So family could not be convinced for parotidic polyngioma and baby had ascites and ultimately collapse. So that's the issue regarding HIDA scan. Liver biopsy is a very good test, should be done on time, should be done by trained pediatric gastroenterologist. The findings in liver biopsy are with bilateral proliferation, plugs and ducts, fibrosis and lymphocytic proliferation in portal tract. So you have a bilateral proliferation, you have lymphocytic proliferation in the lab. Now management is primarily supportive and replacements. So one is nutritional, if they have proactive infection and associated problem, they should be treated. So breastfeeding should be continued. These babies need supplemental MCT oil, higher calorie intake, more than 125% RDA, protein somewhat on the lower side, lipid somewhat on the lower side. The fat should contain 2-3% to of calories from essential fatty acid. And if they are not feeding well, they should be fed with nasal acid 
Fat soluble vitamin should be given in adequate amount. Vitamin A, B, E, K should be supplemented. And the dictum is whenever you see a baby with neonatal polysthesis, even before talking with the parents, inject vitamin K. Because vitamin K deficiency and hemorrhagic disease, newborn or ICH, leads to majority of the deaths because of neonatal polysthesis. Now, if they have pruritis or even otherwise also, you should start them with arsodeoxycholic acid, which these days comes in liquid, liquid preparations as well. They are more prone for infection because there is anesthesia, liver disease, and ascites, so cyphotaxinomic acid can be started in them if they are having. And liver transplantation remains the only option with EHVA, and if they are having decompensative liver stage disease like ascites or antipathy or failed port wine trust. Now, these are two specific conditions. One is polysthesis in very low birth weight. The reason being immaturity of biliary excretion, diminished immune response to sepsis. They are increased incidence of neck and short bowel syndrome. They are more exposed to parental nutrition. And, and the management again is in these babies who are having polysthesis and very low birth weight, you can postpone the task and liver biopsy until the corrected gestation is left down and weight is more than 2 kg. So dear friends, the carry home message is that always ask urine and stool color in any jaundice baby. If the jaundice is persisting beyond two weeks, even if it looks like unconjugated hyperbil, at least once you should have a fractionated bilirubin level to know whether it's a direct hyperbil or not. A pale stool is more alarming than jaundice because after first week, usually unconjugated hyperbil will not do any harm. But if you are having pale stool, the baby can be having polysthesis. Always rule out bilirubin trisia in case of neonatal polysthesis with pale stool. Let HEDA scan and torch never delay a diagnosis of bilirubin trisia. Do not get trapped by HEDA scans and torch screening. And institute vitamin early in neonatal polysthesis, specifically vitamin A. Whenever you see a baby more than two weeks with neonatal polysthesis with pale stool and jaundice, institute vitamin A first dose in front of you. Never leave it to nurse. Never leave it to prescriptions. Thank you.